so glad to be back live again we had technical difficulties for a few weeks and finally have all of that fixed and taken care of and we give God praise for that but we welcome each and every one of you today and as we turn to the word of God um, for all of you that are, are watching us live today or we'll be watching um, in the future later today or tomorrow this week um, we are definitely want to uh, again keep so many people in prayer over the tragedies the senseless murders in El Paso and in Dayton Ohio yesterday and late or early this morning late last night um, it's just the world that we are in today and our society is just crumbling and falling apart but I, I thank God that we know a Savior. I thank God that we know a God. But but you see, the, the key here is that we may know him, but he knows us. And he's expecting something from you. Did you hear me now? Come on, I'm, I'm going to ruffle some feathers this morning because what we hear about all these things taking place. But my question is, what are you doing about it? Are you going to sit and complain or are you going to say, well, thank God I'm safe and I'm okay. But God has called us to stand up in this world in this time to be a light into this world, to be salt into this earth, to be a flavor, to bring about change and a manifestation of God's power into our communities, into our homes, into our neighborhoods, and into this nation and around the world. So therefore, uh, I may ruffle a few feathers today, but, but I'm not going to apologize because it's time that we understand where we are and who we are and what is expected of us. It's more than just showing up. It's more than listening to a sermon. It's even more than paying your tithes. It's about being out there and doing something for God. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. First Samuel, if you turn with me, first Samuel, chapter number one, I'll make it simple. I'll I'll, I'll keep it to first Samuel and and keep it to the first chapter. Amen. It's good to see everybody in the house of the Lord this morning. Again, we welcome all of you that are watching us live stream. We're happy to have you with us and we're praying for you. Amen. Again, uh, in the way of announcements, just remember for those of you that are, are viewing too live this Wednesday night, we have our hot topic series, the fourth in our series. Uh, this Wednesday night, it will be the church and mental health. And we're so happy that we we have a psychologist from Bayshore Counseling Center in Annapolis, Maryland. They are connected with Focus on the Family, and uh, they will be a part of that conversation on Wednesday night. Begins at 
6.30 with some free light dinner and, and then we move in at 7 o'clock with our conversation and it runs till 8.30. So we invite you to be a part of that. You can check our Facebook page if you want to come and be a part of that. Please RSVP because the seats are limited and once we fill up, we shut down because uh, we want to make sure that there's enough of food and also we want to keep it intimate enough so that we can have the kind of interaction and dialogue and conversations that we've had in our past hot talk series. So uh, we invite you to be a part of that. First Samuel chapter number one, beginning of verse number one, I'm going to jump down. I'm not going to read all the way through. Uh, we'll look at the first two verses and then jump down to verses six and seven. Then I want to jump all the way down to verses 19 and 20. So you follow me now? Amen. I, I'm also going to read the scriptures in Greek. So I hope you can follow along. Uh, oh, wait a second. This is Old Testament, so I'll read it in Hebrew. All right. Amen. Amen. Here we go. Now there was a certain man, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. Now there was a certain man, a Ramath Amazophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jerohom, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraite. And he had two wives. Hmm. Here we go. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Panina. And Panina had children, but Hannah had no children. Turn your neighbor and say she had none. Now jump down to verse number six. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Verse number 19. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah and Elkanah and knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore, it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Because I have asked him of the Lord. Lord Jesus, we pray for your anointing over the word this morning. Let there be a liberty in this house. Let your spirit move, Lord, to every hearer of the word today. Bless and touch, strengthen, agitate, shake, make us what you want us to be. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Now, now, now here we have here, Elkanah had two wives. You know there's going to be trouble right there. John, two wives. You know there's going to be trouble right there. The name of one was Hannah. Now, now H Hannah means grace and favor. And the name of the other was Panina, which meant jewel, ruby, precious, valuable. Hannah, now grace, favor, was unfruitful. Hannah was unproductive, barren. Her womb was dead when Elkanah gave out portions, he gave to Panina and all his sons and daughters portions. But to Hannah, he gave a worthy portion. He gave, the Bible says, a double portion or a double position or double portion of what he had. So Elkanah had come to the conclusion that it did not matter if Hannah ever bore him any children because Panina was very fruitful. So he's saying, hey, look, sweetheart, don't you worry about it. I got my kids. Don't sweat it. I still love you. So, so when we see this, Elkanah was adjusted to the situation, and so was Hannah. Hannah was satisfied with the circumstances because she knew she was the favored wife. Amen. She had Elkanah's attention. She had his affection. Now everything was fine. They had an arrangement, so to speak. They, they had it all figured out. Anybody ever been there? 
where everything is in play, everything is worked out. It may not be exactly what you want, but but it's it's all settled. You, you know you know God's going to still take care of you. You thought you had everything figured out. You you had all of your ducks lined up in a row. It wasn't perfect, but you knew you could make it serve your purposes. Can I get an amen? Then what happens out of nowhere? Wham! Something happened that messed everything up. All your plans and your schemes and and your working and your tweaking and, and playing just is not working anymore. You see, what happens here is Panina starts to provoke Hannah over her barrenness. She starts saying, look what I got. Guess what? I've got all the things that he wants that you can't give him. She starts, her words are harsh, and, and she even becomes hateful in her approach. She's, she's filled with resentment and jealousy because she sees the favor that Hannah has with her husband. And her words are like arrows that stick in Hannah's heart. Now, at first, they just seem to bounce off of her. And it seems like they have no effect. But Panina does not let up. And eventually, church, it becomes clear that the arrows have hit their mark. So now we see that Hannah is now disturbed over the fact and has not borne any children to Elkanah. But Elkanah, he tries to pull her back and get her to settle back down and just enjoy what they have. Am I not better to thee than 10 sons, he asked? But Hannah has been awakened. Hannah has become, Mother Satan, she's become uncomfortable and she's become dissatisfied, Sarah, and, and discontented and, and, and with the things as they are. She's, she's saying, you know what, I don't like what I see. I'm going to be moving around. I don't like what I see. I, I don't like this situation. And now what happens is discontent and, and discomfort and frustration. They change into a desire and a craving and an expectation and a need for more. I am no longer satisfied with the status quo. I don't like the fact that people can point at me and say, look, you don't have this and you don't have that oh your church isn't huge or you don't have a lot of money or guess what she's not as pretty as you think she is people throw all of that negativity your way and you say to yourself you know what brother robert i just don't like hearing that anymore you know what i I think I have a right to have a little bit more than what I've got right now. Can I get an amen? You know, I, I feel like that this this is just kind of stirring something in me. And it's not a hate back towards them, but it is a discontentment. It's a realization and maybe even a revelation that there's got to be something more than what I've got right now. And Hannah, she begins to realize there is more than this. I was created for more than this. And now she looks past Alcanum, all the love, all the favor, all the material blessings she gets, and none of that can satisfy her anymore. They cannot open her womb. They cannot meet her need. And I came by to tell you this morning there is a cry from the spirit of every true believer for a life that is higher, hear me now, than money, higher than popularity, higher than worldly success, higher than religion itself. Inside the womb of every true child of God is a cry for the miraculous. There is a cry for signs and wonders and miracles. There is a cry from the spiritual womb for the manifestation of the power of Almighty God to be fruitful, to birth souls into the kingdom. There's a time in us. 
that shakes us and says we've got to have more. I know there is more. And I really believe there, there is somebody who is looking past Elkanah. You, and Elkanah represents the love, the blessings, and the favor. And you're, look, you're going to cry out to God and you're going to contend with God for the glory and for his power. In other words, church, somebody, maybe not everybody, but maybe somebody listening wants more out of life than to just go along to get along. Maybe there is just somebody that's listening to the words. Somebody is wanting a life that has maximum impact. Oh, I wish I had at least one or two people in here that would agree with me. And you would let the devil know right now that you're a force to be reckoned with. And you got to let the devil know, man, you're quiet in here this morning because you got to let the devil know that you are a contender, that you want more than just to be blessed. You want more than just to be making it to the end. You want more than just another happy Sunday service. You want to make a maximum impact. You see, you see what's going on in our world. You see it all. And, and you, you are saying, what is this world coming to? And, and we see what's happening. We say, how can I, one person, make a difference? But inside, you know, there is a possibility. You believe in the supernatural. Can I get an amen? You know that God can make a way. Amen. Yes. You want this life to be more than just what it is. Amen. I mean, are you tired of the struggles? Are you tired of the sickness? Are you tired of the small things? You want this life to be more than just what it is. You want your life to really mean something. And all of this, Brother Robert, is possible through the Holy Spirit. See, John, the whole mission and the operation of the Holy Spirit and the assignment over the fivefold ministry is to bring every believer to the place of maximum impact. It's what it is. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13 says, And he gave some apostles and, and some prophets and some evangelists and, and some pastors and, and teachers. For what? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So in other words, what this means is it brings every believer to the place of maximum impact. Maximum, that means, means, means greatest in quantity or highest in degree attainable. It's the most, it's the best. And then impact, impact means influence. It means the force of impression of one thing on another. So this is the aim and the goal of the Holy Spirit the church and all the ministries to bring every child of God to the place where not only do they make it to heaven, but where they are living, their lives are at maximum impact. Mm, man, I, 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 just, I just wish you heard me today. Living the Christian life at the highest degree attainable experiencing and manifesting the best and the highest and the greatest and affecting and influencing others with the force of maximum life. You see, I love you and I would like you to love me. But my goal in ministry is not to be your buddy. It is to push you push you to your destiny. And I've discovered that a lot of people in the church are very comfortable. A lot of people in the church are satisfied right where they are, and they do not like to be pushed. I pushed some people and they've left. 
So if you come by and, and you push somebody, even if it's in the right direction, even if it's good for them and it's in their best interest, if you push them, you will not be their favorite person. Can I get an amen? But I love you enough to keep on pushing to take the flack, to take the criticisms, to take the hostility and keep on pushing even if you think I'm a pain in the neck because I want you to experience a life of maximum impact. And in other words, what am I trying to say? I'm saying, guess what? Stop coming in here sitting in the same seat. Stop showing up when it's convenient to you. Stop saying, well, I'm a faithful member of the church because I tithe every once in a while. Mm. Mm. Hey, just because you're watching me doesn't mean it's free. Right? There's a cost to everything. And, and, and so when I push you and say, hey, you know what? You should be praying more. Hey, you know what? You, you, you should be in the word more because, because I can tell the way you're talking to me. The only time you're in the word is on Sunday morning. Mm. I told you I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out some stuff today that might rattle you a little bit. But it's, I'm doing it because I'm trying to push you. I'm trying to push you in the direction where, where God has something great for you and you just need a little push over that little hump to get there in fact you might even come to say the same thing about me that Hannah has said about Penina she's my adversary you're a thorn in my side you, you, you make me uncomfortable you irritate me in fact I can't stand you Penina provoked Hannah over her barrenness the point is hannah had more in her but she was satisfied to have the love of her husband and be blessed and favored and never reach for more or believe for more or expect more until mother Satan, she was pushed until she was provoked now, I don't come up here and, and preach to make friends. I'm, I'm here to push somebody and to provoke somebody this morning. And I'm here as an adversary, the good kind, by the way. Is that all right, Sherry? All right. I know Sherry got me a Greek salad the other night and some lamb chops. And now I'm going to be chopping at her this morning. She was like, Pastor, I just fed you the other night and, and now you're going to attack me. You see, I'm an adversary to status quo religion. I'm an adversary to lukewarmness and indifference. I'm an adversary to settling for crumbs when you can have the whole loaf, which we did. Amen. I'm an adversary to sitting in the church and never reaching for more, never seeking more, never contending for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, never reaching for the gifts of the Spirit, never casting out devils or laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. I'm an adversary to a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. I'm an adversary to a religion that can be satisfied just knowing you're saved while the rest of the world goes to hell. You see, I'm an adversary to self-righteous, snooty-nosed Christians who want to sit in the church and pass judgment on everybody that don't meet their standards. That's why we do our Hot Topic series. That's why we talked about abortion. That's why we talked about same-sex marriage. That's why we talked about cohabitation and premarital sex. That's why we're talking about mental illness. Oh, the, yeah, we, we, we just want to go through the motion and sing Kumbaya and make, make it seem like everything's all right. Churches today are more focused on what you've got in your pocketbook or your wallet than what's in your heart. But my God, God is saying, you know what? 
Pastor, you got to be an adversary to, to laziness. And I'm, I'm, I'm an adversary to your laziness and your rebellion. I'm an adversary to unwillingness to be faithful to the work of the kingdom of God. Somebody said, preacher, you're making me mad. Well, praise the Lord. I hope before I'm finished, I make every one of you mad enough. That's motivated. Motivated against the devil. Mad against the devil. I don't know if Hannah and Panina ever became friends, but I do know this. If it weren't for her adversary, if it weren't for Panina, Hannah would have lived her entire life with a barren womb. She was blessed, but barren. Favored, but barren. Comfortable, but barren. Graced, but fruitless. Somebody provoked Hannah to believe for more, to reach for more, to expect more, and to produce more. Can I get an amen? Remember what I told you Panina means. It means jewel, precious, valuable. In other words, what I'm trying to say this morning, the most valuable thing and Hannah's life was the thing that provoked her to cry out to God for more. You see, Elkanah loved her, but he wouldn't push her. He wouldn't provoke her. He didn't want to upset her. You know, it frustrates me sometimes when I, when I provoke people in the church and, and I talk to you. And, and, and sometimes my wife and I will sit back and we'll talk and we'll say, well, if I say this to so-and-so, they just might leave. Oh, yeah, you know what? The, the practical side is, and we've said that we're like, well, if they leave, they leave. But when the bills come in. And those people who used to tie are no longer here. All of a sudden, John, in the back of my head, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking, and Robert, I'm thinking, you know what? I better be a little careful. I better not provoke them because I got to pay the electric bill this month. But then I go back to the word and I see and say, God is my supplier, not brother so-and-so, not sister so-and-so. Oh, things may be tight, but God always promises to make a way and he'll be here on time. And my job, my responsibility, what I'm accountable to is to make sure that not only are you saved, but that you are a productive member for the kingdom of God. So I've got to push you. i got to provoke you. Sometimes i got to chat ties you sometimes I gotta say this is the real thing I am NOT the man of God I am today because my spiritual leaders and teachers always patted me on the head and agreed with everything I did and never corrected me or rebuked me no sir if it hadn't been for some men and, and women of God that told me the truth that corrected me even when it made me mad I would have spent my life just going through the motions, holding on, hanging out, waiting for the rapture to take place. Come on, Lord, I, I'm just going to go through this till you get here. But thanks be to God, I had some people that loved me enough to tell me the truth and instruct me in the way of righteousness and to provoke me. So if I disturb you, if I agitate you, if I aggravate you, it's all worth it if I motivate you. Now, I'm not trying to aggravate you in a way where you get mad and ticked off and leave. But sometimes you got to think about it. You know, you know, you know, as you know there, there are times when, and I'm this way, that when people say I, I can't make it or I can't do it, Brittany, that just puts fire in my bones and say, I'm going to prove you wrong. I can't do it. I can't make it. Oh, the church can never grow. Really? You just wait and see. Yeah, but you've been saying that for years. Yeah, well, you just wait and see. I haven't given up. I haven't quit. I'm still here. I may get aggravated, but it pushes me to keep going, to not give in, not give up. I learned something a long time ago. 
the people who get up early to go to work appreciate the rooster who crows at daybreak. But the people who are lazy and have no ambition and no goals and no dreams and no expectations, they hate the rooster and they just want to kill him because they want to just roll over and go back to sleep. <laughs> but I've decided whether you love me or hate me, I'm going to keep on crowing <laughs> and with help and grace of God, I believe I'm going to provoke somebody to get up and get moving. I want to provoke you to start walking in your destiny. Because somebody that's listening to me my right now, you, you've been like Hannah. You're saved. You know God loves you. You know you have favor in your life to a degree. You know you have the grace of God in your life. And you've become comfortable. You're comfortable with your religion. You're satisfied with where you're at. You're saying it's not the best, but it could be a lot worse. You've adjusted to your situation. You've settled in and said, this is where I'm going to hang until he comes again. But I believe God has sent this word to stir you up, to wake you up to provoke you, to get you up and get moving, to get in the press and contend for his presence and his power and his glory. And let me say it this way. God wants me to push you and provoke you because there is more in you. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Shut up within your spiritual womb are resources that have never been touched here and now. There are ministries, there are songs, there are books, there are gifts and talents. There are anointings and there are dreams and, and visions that are locked up in your belly. And God is here to open your spiritual womb. There's something about God that hates to see waste. God is disturbed when he sees so much potential lying dormant. Sees it just going to waste. Seeing you showing up every Sunday and that's all you do is show up. I knew it'd be quiet in the house this morning. At least I can get an amen on face. Look. Just going through the motions. Praise God, I'm saved and that's all I'm worried about. Praise God, I paid my tithes this week. That's all I have to do, nothing more. But you see, I believe somebody this morning realized there's more in you. That, that, that spiritual womb is saying there's more in you. You're the one that can rebuke that spirit that wants to do another crazy shooting. El Paso yesterday, Dayton, Ohio, early this morning. Could it be Baltimore, Maryland this afternoon? Could it be? Could it be Arundel Mills? Could it be Walmart and Severn? Hey, they're shooting them right down the parking lot trying to get as many as they can. How many police officers have you seen walking around Walmart? Not, I don't. So that means how many more people could be shot? But God is pushing us and provoking us and saying that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities. And therefore, that lets me know that I've got to do more than just read the news and say, woe is them. That I've got to say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke every demon and spirit, everything that has a control of people in this area that wants to do damage, that wants to do harm, that wants to hurt people, whether it be a woman that's being battered by her husband, whether it's a child being abused by a loved one, so to speak, or whether it be some crazy shooter that wants to see how many he can take down before he's taken down. But the Bible says 
that whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven and whatever is loosened on earth is loosened in heaven and that lets me know that in this womb that may have been barren is really there is something there that God is burning in me and pushing in me and through the Holy Spirit Robert I can begin to pray and when I pray it all of a sudden moves things aside and there's a covering I can pray and dispatch thousands of angels from heaven to cover this community to cover my neighborhood to cover my nation so that it doesn't happen anymore that I can pray for a revival that starts on the East Coast and sweeps across to the West Coast and goes around the world and shows right back up here. Why? Because I was pushed. I was provoked. And I knew that there was something in me that was greater than where I am right now. And it's not because of me, but it's because I am in me. Can I get an amen? You see, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 1 19, and they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife and the Lord remembered her. Then the next verse, verse 20, tells us that Hannah conceived and Samuel was born. What I'm saying in closing is this. It was through worship that Hannah's womb was opened. Hear me now. It was through worship. Worship tapped into those hidden resources. Through worship, she broke the curse of barrenness. Through worship, her womb was opened. Sister Lila was no longer, woe is me. It was no longer, look, I've got this problem. My husband is sick. And the last three days, all I've done is spend all of my time in the hospital with this person and that person and that person because that's where you're at but if all of a sudden you look at that situation of barrenness of brokenness of hurt of physical sickness and you say you know what I'm gonna begin to worship him because I know there's something greater in me than what is in the world that I know that when I begin to worship God and give him praise and start early in the morning that God is gonna do something because worship tapped into the those hidden resources through worship she broke the curse of barrenness through worship her womb was opened through worship she became the instrument that God used to birth one of the greatest men and prophets that ever lived my God you don't know the full potential that God has placed inside of you but through worship, we become a channel of blessing to the world. And I believe as we spend time, not only in praying, but when we begin to spend time, Mother State, in worshiping God, that spiritual wombs are going to be opened. That spiritual births are going to take place. I'm believing, church, ministries will be birthed. I'm believing that somebody will give birth to a new song. Somebody else will give birth to a way to reach a friend that, that they haven't reached in a long time because it's been inside of you for a long time. But as you worship, it's coming into manifestation. Station. Somebody is giving birth to a new vision. As you worship, God is bringing clarity. God is bringing understanding. New levels of anointing are being birthed. New passion for souls and a burden for the lost is being birthed. Just as worship opens the heavens, it also opens your spiritual womb and your spiritual womb becomes a door on this earth through which heaven is manifested. I had a long talk with a Christian leader in California yesterday. 
and she was talking to me about an event that she put on with the governor's wife in California and the attacks that she gets from the left and the right because Christians are saying, don't you see where that administration stands? How can you be connected to them? And then she gets attacks from the other side saying, hey, you know, you, you, you're just not loose enough. You don't agree with us. And I told her, I said, how can we bring about revival if we can't stand upon the word of God? The problem is religion, as it always has, has become a stumbling block. Religion has become a curse that people use to bind people. When really a relationship with Jesus Christ is supposed to be transformative, it's supposed to be renewing, it's supposed to be life-giving, and that the Word of God is the instrument, the vehicle, the pathway by which we get to connect with our Savior and have our lives transformed and for the Holy Spirit to move in us and through us but too often we take this holy writ and we use it as a weapon to attack others where I do not see Jesus attacking anybody with the word except to the religious leaders worship him in spirit we must worship him indeed it's not just giving him a praise our worship must be an example of the way we reach people the way we love them whether they love us not back did not Jesus say out of our your belly out of your innermost being out of your spiritual warm would flow rivers of living water would you stand to your feet with me as I close because that's what he said that's what he promised us and so I want these new levels of anointing taking place in your life I want God to change you and transform you and just as worship opens the heavens it also opens your spiritual womb and your spiritual womb becomes a door on this earth through which heaven is manifested so we've got to worship him in our actions and in our deeds and as you do that you begin to move and you will begin to to, to experience a life of maximum impact you see we cannot leave here the way we came we cannot turn off our computer the way we turned it on. You've heard the Spirit of God speak this morning. And you know you were created for more than just going to church. More than just hearing a sermon. And, you're, and just more than just waiting for Jesus to come. You've been called to be a vessel, to be a vehicle, to be an instrument, to bring about change in the areas of influence that God has placed you in. I want to close in prayer. And don't be surprised when I call you this week and challenge you. Get upset. Get ticked off. I don't care as long as it motivates you. Get mad at me. I'll give you Pastor Hill's phone number. You can call and complain to him. Sweet Jesus. Folks, you see it on the news all around you. It's not going to be legislation that's going to stop the killings. It's going to be you and me praying, being an instrument, letting God use us to bring about revival that shuts all of that down. Laws legislate, but you see laws are always broken. But when the Holy Spirit moves, daily thousands are added to the church. Lives are transformed. That's how it takes place. Grab your neighbor's hand right now, would you? Amen. Lord Jesus.
And as you're watching right now, I'll grab your hand and I pray with you. Lord, stir us, shake us, do what it takes to remove the barrenness within our spirit. God, you created me for more than what I am right now. You made me, Lord, to be greater than what I am right now. I'm not talking about being a, a celebrity, but I'm talking about being an instrument that brings about world change. I'm a world changer. You're a world changer. The world that you have placed us in, Lord, we can see it change because we're your instrument. We're your vessel. We're your vehicle. Shake us and stir us, Lord. Strip away what needs to be stripped away so that we can become what you've made us to be. I rebuke every demon and every spirit. I rebuke the flesh itself in the name of Jesus. I rebuke every attitude. I rebuke all of the world's worldliness. We don't live by their standards. We live by the Holy Writ. Cover us, Lord, and use us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you.